And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have one new face and one not so new face in the <laughs> red in the red corner. Hey, hailing from hailing from so, hailing from so, from some godforsaken end of Indiana, the cre the creator of the upco of the upcoming adaptation um, role playing adaptation of Chew, a foodie crime drama. The ma the man known as Pete Petrusha. Apologies if I got that wrong. Oh, perfect. The noosh. And I'm in, in, the I'm blue, in the blue corner, hailing from Penny for a Tale and the man who seems dead set on cursing my timeline, the, right. one, the one and the form, the man formerly responsible for inflicting necrobiotic on the role playing world, <laughs> the one and only Mitch Mitchell Wallace. How you two doing? Yeah, I come out swinging. Uh, <laughs> Pete, uh, make a make a reflex save. I'm going right for the face. Let's do this. Hey, hey, hey. watch the watch the face. No rabbit punches. Ah <laughs> oh, man, I don't make the rules. I just enforce them. Ah, that's fair. Okay. <laughs> um, that's why I wear, that's why I wear the ref shirt. It's a good shirt. It's a good look on you. I'm just glad. I'm just glad they were able to find one that fit. So. <laughs> I've gotten the backstory when it came to when it came to you, Mitch. But there's a bit of a tradition I have to I have to go into. Um, yeah. It's tradition to kind of go. It's tradition. Whenever I have somebody new on, it's tradition to go into um, how they got how they got into role playing and what made it um, stick. So, Pete, this is a case where you're where you're in the hot seat. So, what's your, no, your yeah. tabletop origin story? I feel bad for Mitch. He's gonna hear me say this a million times. But <laughs> I know, right? Like I'm my, tired of hearing it, Pete. I have, I have this like, okay. So it all starts. At, there was a Hobby Town USA, which was a franchise that we used to have nearby us, and they said they had like model sets for the most part, like model cars and stuff. And I was a 12 year old who was, I wouldn't say dragged by my dad. It was like buy Toys R Us. So sometimes we'd go in there, but didn't have anything I really cared about. And they had three role playing games. And they were on, you know, those little bent stands on the lowest level shelf. And it was, like, in between a whole bunch of other stuff. But, like, like I had to bend down to, like, look at them. And one of them was Shadowrun 2nd Edition. And it had, like, you know, wires going into people's heads and, like, an elf chick with a mohawk. And they were all, like, in dark clothes. And, and at 12 years old, I don't think I'd really seen, like, cybernetics or, like, attitude sort of stuff other than, like, pro wrestling or something. <laughs> And I watched a little bit of anime, but I don't remember where I was at at 12 years old. Um, but the long story short was it just kind of blew me away. And I was always a kid who, like, I pretended, like, on the, you know, when I was out, like, at recess and whatever, and I'd make all my friends be, like, Fox McCloud or whatever, some video game characters I liked, and run around the neighborhood with, like, a wooden sword, and we'd play, like, our art, like, Final Fantasy character, you know, mm -hmm. properties, right? Oh, yeah. And when I found RPGs, it was easy for me to fall hard. And I think my friends were always my people because I was an only child for most of my life. So finding something where I could, like, be with them and express myself and be creative and, like, I always played pretend anyway, it was, like, so my jam. But I really found my game store through Magic the Gathering. It started years before that when I got a Shadow and Second Edition book. Had no idea what a role-playing game was for years. And then... um yeah, Magic the Gathering put me next to people who knew what role-playing games were. And I was like, oh, that's what this is? I just thought it was cool looking. And put me next to people playing role-playing games. Where I started, you know, it's like, hey, someone's about to leave. Can you play the fighter for D&D &D or something? And uh, I, I realized that Magic the Gathering had limitations and wasn't as social and as interesting as role-playing games. So that, that's really where I got my, my feet wet. Started to taste different games. And met some great people. And realized, especially later on in life, realized, hey... You have like great times running games, and you were good at it. So, those memories I hold on to forever as well. So, mm -hmm. I give you a lot. <laughs> no, you get you gave me about you gave me as much as I as I as I typically ask when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, good, good, yeah. 
now when it now with with that kind of thing in mind, um, this is a, this is a this is this is a unique opportunity um, on my end because a lot a lot of times when I've had when I've done these interviews, it's never on it's never been on an it's rarely been on an adaptation of something that someone's yeah. working on. So, how did you guys first discover Chew? So this is going to be a very peculiar pick for an adaptation. Yeah, Mitch, your turn. You might be muted, though. Yeah, he is. Okay. Well, I'll start talking, and when he jumps in, he can oh, start. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I thought I was chatting. That's the, I was like, that's the siren call. The up, you somebody somebody was going to somebody was going to upstage you, but you couldn't let that happen. I know. I was like, oh no, no. Well, that you know, it's a boxing match, right? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, Chew has has been one of my favorite comic books uh, for a long time. Um, it's actually the first one I've ever read from like uh, the first issue all the way to the to the finale, uh, and I love and adore it. And so uh, bringing it to the TTRPG world just kind of made sense because there's a lot to love and adore within that world, and a lot of quirkiness and absurdity and darkness to uh, bring to the table. Um, and, and so it just, it felt like a perfect fit. Uh, and I was talking to, um, Rob Guillory, which is how we initially got this whole project, um, was chatting, uh, to him because of a project I was working on with Helmgast. Um, and yeah, afterwards I was like, you know, what would be really cool is a, a true TTRPG. Uh, and he agreed and that just kind of one thing led to another, and now we're here with our our Kickstarter, uh, um, pushing past all the stretch goals and such. Yeah, which is um, it's al it's always it's always ref it's always refreshing when it, when the create when the creator of a non interactive work um has a has has an under has an understanding of of in of interactive of interactive media and and a respect for it, unlike unlike mm -hmm. some. Which is more than I can say for certain Polish for certain Polish authors who will not be named. <laughs> but you probably but name them. You probably can figure out who it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, it's interesting. It's interesting that you mention um, work working on some working on something with Helmgast, who mm -hmm. I've had, who I've had on I've had on here in the past. Um, Thanks, mate. What? But what? What prompted you guys to pick Forged in the Dark as the chassis for this particular project? Ooh. I take this one. Yeah, go ahead. Throw it. I'm throwing it. All over. right. So, I've thought a lot about this, right? And it's one of those good questions we get. That's very, very important because mm -hmm. Mitch and I, from the get go, we're like, yeah, this has to be its own system because we're game designers and we think, all right, there's nothing that's gonna be perfect for this mm -hmm. this property, right? Like it's gonna touch on all the things we need, especially Chew, because Chew's like all over the place. Mm -hmm. Like the best thing about Chew is maybe its range that it can be so dark and so horrible, and so gory and over the top. But then sometimes it's so lighthearted and zany and like lovable. So Force in the Dark, it's procedural. It is kind of like it has a really great way it sets up every action that you do like the conversation of doing it so we thought that'd be great when we bring people to this game who might be new to role-playing games it'd be good for those game masters who try running a game for the first time because it kind of breaks down the thought process of like what a gm does like every time they're posed with the question of like can i roll this or what can i do this it, it says that's a position and an effect question that's a what's the level of threat and what's the possible outcome based on what I've heard so far? And when you, the player, and you, the game master, know that going in, we can have a conversation about it to kind of have an idea going in of what this could be and to make sure we're on the same page. And the more descriptive I can get you as a game master to you as the player to like add in all the little things that I might want to think about why you'd be better in this situation, or as the game master, all the little things that might be uh, a hindrance to you. We can do that, and we do that with how we frame each scene. Uh, you know, when you um, – one of the other great things is, like, there's this resistance thing with Forge in the Dark. And like I said, with the range of Chew, like, it can get real dark and out of the blue and just at the snap be like, oh, my God, they just killed so-and-so, but they did it horribly. And 
we can say things like we can just describe how your character is you know horribly brutally killed and it doesn't have to be like in great detail right but the player can have the agency and actually has resources on their paper that says mm-hmm. cool i can spend this and i can resist what the gm's trying to do to my character it's not an if i can it's a i am because i have enough to spend to do so mm-hmm. so then and then there's flashbacks and the, this whole position thing that's like we always talk about like what the threat level is of you doing a thing and we can like reward you with your playbooks with special abilities to like try to make you do more risky things or more desperate things like the comics so all i'm really saying here is there's a ton of great stuff that like <laughs> you know we we put our, our toe in spin it around a little bit and we're like oh that feels nice mm-hmm. oh yeah now with now with that in mind did you did did you get? Did you guys both end up discovering the Chu comic independently, or was it a case where one of you discovered it and then the other and wouldn't and wouldn't shut up about it? So, pe- and the other one got peer pressured into it. <laughs> what do you uh, think? I mean, we, yeah, there's some truth I mean, to that. What do you think? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's some. Like, I, I had my wife got me the the comic books, and like, I, I've been a fan of Chu for for a while, mm-hmm. um, and. Like I was like, oh man, I really want to make a DGRPG, uh, and I could I could think of no one I wanted to work with more than than Peter, and so I I messaged him was like, you know, wanna let's do this together, like you know the Avengers, right? Um, and that's kind of how that all started, and and kind of where where we're coming from in, in terms of this whole thing. So I I, I probably roped him in. Uh, I don't know how how do you feel, Pete? Did did I rope you in? I mean, it's one of those offers. It's like the Godfather, you know. Yeah. Mitch, Mitch brings this thing up, and I'm like, "You think they would do it?" You know. But I'm already, I'm like shaking my head. But it's like a text message, you know. You're like, "Yeah, like they would do this. Like, why, why would they give us this property? Like, how, you know?" Because I, I spent a lot of time working with a lot of other people in the indie game scene. Um, as my, I spent years being the in, uh, the game, the convention coordinator for the indie game developer network. So I've worked with like a hundred plus, uh, yeah. and people come in and out of the organization of like other independent game designers and freelancers, and then that opens all kinds of networking. But I've heard all kinds of stories. You know, I've talked to all kinds of people, whether it's like people who've worked with Marvel or people who are trying to get the Harry Potter license or people who've worked with different comic creators. So I have like a lot of ideas of like what this looks like. But generally speaking, for the most part, like ninety percent of the time, the people who are like hunting for these just keep getting turned down. So when Mitch brought this up, and you know, in Mitch's very nonchalant way, is like, "Hey, do you think would you like to do that?" I'm like, "Well, of course I'd like to do it, but I mean, you're joking, right?" But um, yeah, it worked out, and it worked out great. So, and for what is for what it's worth, if you don't if you don't mind me giving a bit of a history lesson, because I'm a wannabe historian, um, I have to head. the sole re- the sole reason that Iron Crown got the license to do the um, got the got the license to do the 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 um, Lord of the Rings game that they did with Middle Earth role playing was because nobody else asked first asked before they did. <laughs> yeah, like I my my whole philosophy is just ask for it. I mean, I'll go to Wendy's and I'll ask for a steak, you know, <laughs> or go to like. Are, yeah, you the, are you the kind of person who would go who would go to a vegan restaurant and a, and ask for a beef dish and then and then and then say no, I'm in a yeah. beef dish, I'm in a beef dish, and then and then keep switching back and forth. <laughs> Cause that sounds yes, like exactly. You would do. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, yeah. hey, uh... <laughs> I'm taking you to a Wendy's. <laughs> Take, sir. This is a Wendy's. I'm gonna be like, yeah, but I, I, I would really a like this. And I'm gonna really like record. Like I'm gonna record. I'm, you know, it's gonna be a stretch goal. I'm gonna record <laughs> Mitch going to a Wendy's, asking for a steak with like a shoe <laughs> shirt on. <laughs> yeah. So they know who they're dealing with. They're like, oh god, these guys. Yeah. So I, it's, um. Look, I, look, I've, I meant, I've, I've gotten away with the old gag of, do you got two, do you have two tens for a five at least once? So I'll, I'm not one, I'm not one to pass judgment. I love that you, you call, you would say you're a historian though, because like I geek yeah. out about RPGs clearly. So like I, like, have you read Designers and Dragons? Like I love Designers and Dragons. I have. I've read that. I've read um a theor- I've read a theory of fun, and um, blowing up the movies and a bunch of other stuff. I was, you care about like TSR? Are you following what Ben Riggs is doing? Um, 
I fu- Wisconsin, I, I, though. I don't know if Wisconsin and Minnesota, you know, fist fight or whatnot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's thinking about it, though. <laughs> Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Chicago. You get, you get, you get, um. They're the same place, right? <laughs> I'm going to pretend you did not say that. <laughs> in the in the words of Joe Bob Briggs. But. If you get if you get a guy from Minnesota, a guy from Wisconsin, a guy and a guy from Chicago in the same room, the only thing that they will agree on is that two of the other people in that room are wrong. <laughs> it's, yeah. Especially especially given um the the way um the way sport the way sports were pl- were played back in the back in the old days, it's the reason why it's called the black why the NFC North was called the Black and Blue Division. <laughs> hey, geez. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, I have, I have, been keep, I have been keeping a, I've been keeping a passive, passive eye, but um, I don't, I don't really, ca- I don't really care about whatever company banner um, there, there is. All I care about is what is what the final product is going to be. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. Like I didn't when um when there was that whole T- when there was that TSR Games brand that came that came out with a brand new top secret. I didn't care about. I didn't. I wasn't somebody going. Yes, DSR is back or, or anything like that. I was like, oh, a new sure, top secret. Yeah. Let's take let's take a look at it. And then I did it for um. T- I did a review of it for TSR month. Yeah, was- they uh they actually live near me, uh, which I, I didn't know. Mm-hmm. But I do I do like I do like um I li- I do I've always liked say documentaries and yeah. get, and getting a getting a feel for. The causal cha- the causal chain of events of things, um, even more so when it comes to when it comes to things that go way out of hand. I would pay, I would pay very I would pay very good money to to um to see to see a documentary that de- that detailed um the state of T- the state of TSR during the Lorraine Williams era. Yeah, especially given all of the horror stories I keep I've heard I've heard over the years regarding how she ran things. Yeah, well, it's funny because it sounds like you know a lot about like the the early '90s. Talking about ICE, you know, mm. I, I I didn't know that. That's really crazy about ICE. Like literally, they were the first to ask because you know, like the the estate for um <laughs> uh, all of that was like the Lord of the Rings. I'm just thinking if I was saying the wrong one, the the you know the estate has always been an issue. Like getting in contact oh, the, with the oh, people. The, and then, yeah, I have I, ha- I have um I have testimony that de- that demonstrates. If you any any time I hear about the estate being a problem, I can I can believe it because of um the fact that a few um a couple of years ago I had um Stephen Long on, you know the the uh, the guy behind, the guy behind Hero, or at least Hero as everybody sees it, um but he is but he was also responsible for the Lord of the Rings and um Star Trek games under the uh, Decipher years, and. I had I had asked him who I had asked him about his experiences working with Paramount versus working with his working with the estate. It said Paramount was great, the estate less so. <laughs> they were mm-hmm. um they were very they were very anal about about what books you could draw from and what books you couldn't and even what sections of books you could draw from. Like you couldn't draw from that um, appendix thing in um, Return of the King. I don't know why. Yeah, that's very specific, and yeah, I, I, just, I know I heard it. somewhere that they were like, you know, even sometimes they'd push you. They'd be like, they what? What's the? This is <laughs> lame that I don't remember. What's the book that's like after Lord of the Rings? Like it starts with like an S, like uh, the Sim- 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 oh, the Cimmerillion. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. That yeah. was one. That and, was uh, one that you were not allowed. You were not allowed to. According to what I was told, you were not allowed to draw anything from that. Although he kind he kind of snuck a few references in there, anyways, when nobody yeah. was looking. <laughs> because... See, maybe I'm mixing up in my head. I thought that I had um, heard one one person talk about how they were like, "No, we will not put more of that in." <laughs> yeah, which but... I must have mixed it up in my head. But um, yeah. even when I c- but even even with that, I've. I've 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 sometimes wondered if the estate ever fully understood what um what RPGs were. Mm, yeah. Um, Probably just, like just oh from, that, that whole 
just from how mm -hmm. just from how things ended up going down. And I will admit, around around the time that I did a month long special covering previous um, Lord of the Rings RPGs, that was right around the time when Cubicle Seven lost the license, and I don't know why. And I was not happy because I thought that that meant that the second it, that I would not see the second edition of the One Ring. Of course, I didn't at the time. I didn't know that Free League would pick it up, but it, at the same at the same time, I still can't help but wonder what if. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Oh, it's weird now that the, I mean, being totally off off base, right? You're just talking about like. You can have like so many different editions of one game. Like Game of Thrones, when Game of Thrones came to Green Ronin, mm -hmm. I was really excited. And I was like, okay, we're going to do Game of Thrones. Because, you know, my, my significant other was into Game of Thrones. And I'm like, okay, this would be a cool game. I could get, like, get like, we could have like double dates, like, mm -hmm. you know, friends and stuff and couples. Because everyone was into Game of Thrones. And I remember trying to like find it and play it. And it was like every time I went to a convention to try to play it, I played some other version of the game. <laughs> so I like played like first second edition like the the god there was like it's not the unix version but there was like a, the eden eden had like a unix version a that's a that's a whole nother game what what is uh you know uh not nah, god damn it <laughs> the not big eye small mouth what's the zombie one where the, like oh, they unisystem. ate my you're think you're thinking of unisystem which was used that's in, exactly um, what i'm Flesh thinking of yeah um, All flesh must be eaten. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I was like, "How many ways can I play this before I find the right game?" <laughs> it although, worked out. But, although, true, but now although, Lord of the Rings, right? You can have so many freaking. You could be playing the Ice version, the um, Cubicle Seven version. We're gonna have the and this is just like kind of the ones that jumped to my head. Yeah, is there, there's a couple. I know there's a first and second edition of one of the variants. Um, there were two. There were two editions of Merp. There was they did another they did another one called called the um, Lord of the Rings Adventure Game, or um, or, or uh, which is which was meant to be a simplified quote unquote version of Merp, which was itself supposed to be a simplified version of Rollmaster. Um, mm -hmm. I'm putting simplified in heavy air quotes. <laughs> as as in, you should. Look, if look anybody who's doubting me on that, I de I defy you to read the critical hit tables in the in Arms Law and then ke and then get back to me, and then that, <laughs> and then never tell me that never tell me that whatever game you're playing is too complicated ever again. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you heard of Harp? Yeah, because I have a friend that like just geeks out, like loves. He he's older than I am, so he's like in his mid fifties. But like from the day I met him. He was like role master, like that was like his jam. Ice is his jam, you know. Like oh, so, I that company is his jam, okay. and like Harp was his game. And I was like, "What is this? It's like high action, high, adve it, high adventure role play, and high adventure." It, and it's it's the rules light role master, but it's just funny because like it's totally a relic, you know. You're like, this is like the rules light version of role master, which is not even Savage Worlds. Like this totally still belongs in the '90s. <laughs> Yeah, the um, the pro the problem that I I have a hard I'd have a hard time recommending Harp to anyone simply because of the fact that the it has it has very it has very um '90s editing and very '90s navigation, and mm -hmm. that's something I'm I'm going to always be a little bit hesitant on. Um, when it comes, to, but to be honest, the the only the version of the the version of Rollmaster that I'd be most willing to recommend to people. Um, is against the Dark Master, and in full disclosure, the um, the got some of the some of the guys who are responsible for that one are bu are buddies of mine. And I've had them on the show more than more than once. <laughs> but that is basically a spiritual successor to Merp, just without anything that's going to get the estate mad, and a and a little bit of a little bit of '80s fantasy and '80s metal because that's the way he rolls. Um, when but the but I but when it comes to different ver different versions of TTRPGs on under one IP, don't even get me started on the many ge on the many games that Star Wars and Star Trek have spawned over over the last thirty years. <laughs> I could do it. Yeah, I did a I did a I did like a five or six part video on the on the Star Wars RPGs, and there was still a bunch that I skipped. 
including including one I should have covered that actually got a threatening letter from Kenner. Um, mm. and when it comes to Star when it comes to Star Trek, um, the only reason I might I might get into that one of these days is to is to laugh at is to laugh at Paramount's really dumb to sit really dumb reasoning for why they um, dropped it from Fossa. But that's a whole that's a whole other story. Getting back getting back on the rails with um with Chu before we or we end up, yeah. or end up going off end up going off track again. Um <laughs> what, what are you talking about? We're just we're just working our way to two episodes. One yeah. is the history <laughs> lesson that Mitch wasn't born for. And two, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I was Mitch I was, was like <laughs> Mitch is like, I was still just a special project at NASA at that time. I know. I was right? just a little pink baby. Yeah. I it was it was just a project in case like we all died. I know. But I'm I'm a new one. I'd like to I'd like to go a bit I'd like to go a bit into the in, into the, into the pitch when it comes to this cuz with something like Chew, this idea this idea of mixing crime drama and foodie. How exactly how exactly when you're sh- when you're showing this thing off at at demo tables or in play tests, how exactly do you pitch this? <laughs> Um, Mitch, do you want to take it or should I? Uh, why don't you take it and then I'll, I'll, I'll offer what I okay. do. So it's not a quick pitch because the, like the quick pitch still has you asking questions, which sometimes is good. Like it's like the boys meets the wire, but there's a lot in there. So if you could imagine like a world not on like our own where there was a bird flu and there was a massive pandemic and like people had to wear masks, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, it was the avian bird flu, and chicken was outlawed because it was one of the things. It was poultry, right? It was. It was. We lost so many people, like a hundred million people in the world died. Mm-hmm. And it being food, it was clearly under the Food and Drug Administration's <laughs> purview. And being America, we kind of police the world. So the the FDA and the USDA become like the homeland security in the wake of this <laughs> this bird flu. They killed so many people. And it was already a world where there was food powers. So think like X-Men. Like sometimes people are born with it. Sometimes it just manifests like in puberty or later. But like you have powers. But they're only when you cook or like eat something. So they're often like really specific and weird. Like I get stronger if like I'm wearing spaghetti on my head. Mm-hmm. Or I can like uh, I can cook really, really fast. Which is great in combination with other things. Um, or like I can make functional machinery out of chocolate so all that said you play fda agents in this weird absurd variant of our own world where there are people with superpowers there are government agencies with like beefed up budgets there's government unrest in the people and you're just for the most part like comic characters like you're a little over the top you have some kind of fatal flaw that you you take everything too far but you're really just trying to balance, like, doing a good job at work, maybe. Or, like, trying to deal with your personal problems, which we have... Every character has some weird, quirky, personal trouble. Mm-hmm. But with an absurd world and an absurd job that puts you following, chasing down criminals, like the long, long man in one of our adventures who, like, seduces people if they see him eat, like, a long gummy <laughs> or a long baguette or a long anything, as you can see. Um... Maybe they're also dealing in a world where, like, criminals have even changed. They've adapted. So, egg dealing, chicken trafficking, these are the things people want. People are like, I remember what chicken tasted like, and I want it back. (laughs) I want chicken and waffles. And you have to go to, like, speakeasies, like the prohibition. It's like prohibition with alcohol, but it's chicken and eggs. So, that's the world you're in. And uh, it's fun. It's zany. But it, it can get really dark too. So we have this whole range of emotions in these like action-packed adventures that uh, feel like the comics. Yeah, um, it's it's definitely it's definitely Silver Age. I can I can say that um, right now. But it's low power, like in that way that like even people who have crazy things they, they still feel very mundane. Mm-hmm. You know. And- uh, I Some of, I mean, obviously, super villains. Like, there's extremes, but they're never like Superman or you know anything like super powered. I will, I will admit that as you were describing it, one power, one one dumb idea for powers, 
um, came into my, came into my head, and I'm, I'm have sure a dumb idea me. when they're food influenced. <laughs> they're all ridiculous already. Yeah, um, this is true. That be that being that being somebody who uses various types of peppers to make um, bombs. Yep, writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> Of, We're gonna of, call it the, the pepper grinder. Yeah, these. I'm not. I'm not talking like ground up peppers. I'm talking like chi, like um different varieties of chili peppers. With the somebody one, told me the recently, they are, were like, "There's a thing called chuggers." Mm -hmm. Like, if you watch like foodie videos and stuff, and I'm I love when people tell me stuff like this because I'm like, I don't know enough. Mm -hmm. There's so much food cooking video recipe, all the things everywhere that I'm like, I can never know enough. The idea, the idea that popped up in my head is that the, the peppers that are higher and higher on the Sco on the Scoville, um, heat unit scale, um, mm -hmm. create create bigger booms. So, your, sta <laughs> your standard um your standard gr your standard green pepper is has about as much boom as, as say as say the kind of sparklers you would get you would get on the you would get on the cheap because you can't afford actual because you either can't afford fireworks, or you got to go across state lines to do it. Speaking from experience, um, whereas something like, whereas something like a ha something like a um, habanero might ha might have the for might have the force of a hand grenade. Yeah, I know. We all came up with like, what would our power be? Mm -hmm. And you know, they're like tongue in cheek and fun. But I I like spicy stuff. So when you're talking Scoville, you're like right up my alley. Um, but I I said that like so when I eat a ghost pepper. Like, you know, because you think about stuff, one, it's called ghost, and one, like, you can imagine someone, like, burning up in smoke. But, yeah, that, like, I can phase, right? Like, when I eat spicy stuff, when I start feeling it, so I have to, like, eat enough to, like, feel it. And obviously, if I'm eating ghost peppers, that's a thing. So, but when, when I have that heat going on, I can phase through walls because I kind of go up in smoke, right? Would, some, would somebody <laughs> um, but, get but dragon breath from eating dragon fruit? You could. You totally could. Yeah, like, that's exactly the kind of thing that fits very well. And to never forget that, like, these powers, you're still an average person. Like, I can get sick to my stomach from having too many ghost peppers. Uh, I might be feeling it for days, you know? Like, you're gonna, you're yeah. certainly going to feel it when you, had to go, when you have to go to the John. Yeah, exactly. So, so I love that. Like, one of the cool powers we came up with was, like, that you could see the weaknesses in other people. Mm -hmm. But it's only after you eat rotten food. And only for as long as you can stomach it, right? So, like, it's just a very neat thing that like the sicker you get the more you can kind of see the weakness or sickness in other people mm -hmm. <laughs> but then you you know right if you take that too far you're like in the hospital or you, you get doctor visits or you're like puking and laying in bed um which we have rules for too because it is like uh, an experience of like we want people to eat in this game we want them to take r and r because we care about whether or not they're actually doing their job or if they're fucking around so mm -hmm. Um, but with with that in, with that in mind, given given the fact that just with those examples alone, there's a whole lot of variants that you can ha that you can have, and you especially have with any um su with any supers game, no matter how high or low powered it is. Um, how do you how do you make how do you make sh how do you um make sh how do you rein that in so that people don't so that people don't go too far? Is do you have plans for for suggestions on what would be what would be appropriate for the power scaling and what might be pushing it? So it's really funny because I hated this answer when uh, the lead game designer, uh, Justin Ford, mm -hmm. gave it to me. And he's like, you know, one of the big inspirations for this game has been Masks. And Mask is a very popular Powered yeah. by the Apocalypse game about teenage superheroes. Masks basically lets your abilities influence the narrative. You know, it doesn't have the context of like, oh, I have to spend this to do that, or it cost me this much of that, or it has, you know, it, uh, I can do this once per day, or, you know, I, if I have, I get these bonuses. It doesn't care about any of that. It cares about how does it fit in the fiction. And this takes us right back to that Forge in the Dark conversation that was really, really fitting, is that when everything matters in how you describe what you do, mm -hmm. we can talk about how you're oddly specific often hard to use power especially continuously changes the fiction in your actions why you don't have to roll when everyone else does like for running rooftop to rooftop and you, you times that mess mm -hmm. you float we, uh, bubbles 
maybe when you blow bubble gum, you actually levitate. Um, I don't see why you need to roll anymore because literally you can fly. Now, when we're being shot at, maybe it's risky for you and desperate for them because one, they could <laughs> they have to make the jumps, and if they're far buildings from each other, but that's the point is that we realized when we were playtesting that trying to limit the powers and make them expensive to use that balanced them uh, was wrong. It actually just made people not use them. They didn't get as much out of them as they could have. And even abilities like the, the title characters, uh, Sibopathy, where they like get the history of whatever they eat, we, we've made a game where that just changes what that session looks like. Even if it was like a pre-planned adventure, that session just becomes something totally different it's like a different variant of the experience, but it doesn't make one better or worse than the other. Because, well, there's also the level of, like, we don't care. The ultimate goal at the end is not necessarily always to get the bad guy or even the right bad guy or to stop the thing. It, it's always, like, the intent of the agency that tasked you with it, right? But, like, it's still much more about the journey. Uh, because for you, you have a career, and this is just one case. Yeah. Now, given that... Given that... You're, even that this is using um, Forged in the Dark, which, and the history that that that, that system has. Um, in a lot of the in a lot of these set these setups, there's there's a set of um play of playbooks or archetype books, whichever you prefer, if depending on how pedantic you want to be. Um, is Chu going to be in that same tradition? And what would some of the um what would some of the playbooks that it have bring to the table? Mitch, this one's all yours. Uh, the playbooks and such. I mean, like, uh, so for the the playbooks for uh, Chu is it, we kind of got the type of personalities and archetypes from the comic book, uh, and this is like if you read any comic or any story, you can kind of uh, understand a, a lot of this stuff. Um, and, and so we have, like, the hot shot, the expert, uh, the mascot's one of my favorites, you know, they, they do a lot of support, and they, they, they're just happy to be there, um, we also have, uh, the low life, um, so it's just kind of what we wanted to do with the playbooks, uh, was, because that, I think that was a, probably one of the hardest parts about doing this is, do you divide people up by like their powers, their organization, and stuff like that? And we ended up just doing uh, by their personalities and kind of the art type that they play in a comic book story. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I think with that, that just kind of uh, it made it perfect. And so now when you're we're creating a character or you're trying to pick a pregen, uh, you know exactly the type of character you're going to get into. Yeah, yeah, like the playbooks, like what Mitch said is exactly on it. We, the core of the game is that you're quirky characters. Like, while there's an investigation and you'll be tasked as a group to go do something, it's a lot like a lot of the police shows you see, like, in primetime. Mm. Or, or even Dexter, right? Like, every episode has some sort of, like, or every game, short game arc or game session has almost, like, a crime or something to investigate. And while it's cool and important in its own right, the story, the campaign, the long play of the game is about your characters, who are probably talking about, right, returning a videotape, or how someone got pregnant, or, you know, I wish that I could have just got a fucking cup of coffee this morning, but everything in my life is stopping you from getting a cup of coffee while they're doing the investigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, the quirky characters are essential. They're over the top, they're ridiculous, and even with investigative rules and stuff, we're, we're very cautious about making it about the investigation, because what we want is you focusing on being a silly, wacky, very in, in an absurd world, right? Like, Yeah. Now... One of the setups that you have for the, for um, Chu in this case is the is the approach setup, and I'd I'd like to go into I'd like to go into what that's going to be bringing to the, to the to the particular table here. If you'll ex if you'll excuse the pun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So approaches are one of the cool things that we added again because quirky characters is a must for us. Where well, the role play is the focus. Uh, even more so than Blades in the Dark, which is something that we're, we're thrusting it deeper in, right? We're saying that, like, we, we thought that we needed to build on Blades in the Dark to be more about our characters and more about the chemistry of every character as they relate to each other and other people in the world. So how we did that is we added approaches. 
they're very similar to like personality traits or like demeanor traits or attitudes. There are three things that we've themed with food that everyone in the world knows about your character. Everything that you do is influenced by these things. And if you are, for example, a sweet pea or someone who's pleasant as pie, we always take that into consideration for your position and your effect. And even if there needs to be a role or how other people treat you compared to other people, uh, when you tell me that as a sweet pea that you are mad and you're going to hurt somebody and you want the whole world to know, we then remember to translate that to your, your very small voice that's probably very passive, that's very agreeable, that's nodding and smiling while they're very, very angry. Mm-hmm. So yeah. um, that, that's the theme, right? If you're a beefcake, you know, you're like an absolute unit. If you're a jawbreaker, you know, we know you're a fiery one, you're a spicy character. Are you 100% raw? So you like, uh, you know, you live with your heart in your sleeve. You can't tell a lie. You just put it all out there. So we have a bunch of these that are just really, really cool. They're food themed. They're kind of like people's favorite thing about the game a lot of times because they yeah. just they giggle when they think about them. But Mitch, you got more to add to that? No, I, I mean, I think that's good. Like uh, approaches and not only are they just hilarious to look at, uh, but yeah, they just... Uh, uh, it rewards you for kind of playing the character that you you're playing, which is really cool. Um, like a you know, whenever you can add beef beefcake to a roll, I I always feel very satisfied. Uh, you so pick these; they're happen. not playbook based, right? Like, yeah. so if you, whatever character you want to play, mm-hmm. these are also why you stand out or why you're different or you yeah. know, you're very like you be a, a beefcake yeah. expert, you know, which is is a is a nerdy, sexy combination. <laughs> uh. I know when I when I run games, I try to like literally every time you go to roll, I go, "What are your approaches?" Until I remember them, right? And that's just because I'm trying to ingrain in everybody who's playing and in everybody and in myself, remind myself of like that's how cool they are, that's how important they are. Yeah, yeah. Is in the comics, it's like Tony Chu is the lead character. He's that by the book cop. He is. I wouldn't say relentless, but you know, like he's trying to get to the bottom of it. He's a good dude who just is very orderly, is smart. He's not in any one of these like the the absolute best of them. He's a little bit of an everyman, but like he's trying to do his job. He's trying to be diligent. He's trying to be dutiful. He's trying to check the clues and follow the leads. And then you have his partner, which is the Tango and Cash combination of Colby. John Colby is. You know, he's the brash. He's the, he is our hot shot. You know, like our typical hot shot. He's the brash one. He's the one who will slip in some chicken. He's like, come on, come on. Like, you remember you, how much good this tastes. You want some fried chicken, don't you? I know it's our job, but like nobody's looking. Mm-hmm. You know, and at the end of the day, that's the cop that like he means well. He will be there when you need him. He's gonna do the job. He gets to the bottom of it. But you know, all that time in between. I mean, do we have to be that serious? I mean, like we catch the bad guys at the end of the day. It's yeah. okay. Does it really matter if a couple people, you know, hand some eggs to one another? <laughs> you know, so yeah. We wanted to make sure that characters felt like characters, and that they were had these things that stood out about them. Um, and it's also wonderful because when people play, like immediately they have a character in front of them. You know, there's yeah. no feeling out process. Like, who is this person? It's like bam. I, I know the weirdness I'm about to get into. I'm a mascot character, which is like that supportive cheerleader character, yeah. that person who's just going to talk to everyone, who's naive and gullible sometimes. But my version's spicy, and my version's vanilla. <laughs> you know, I'm actually pretty normal, and uh, maybe I'm whipped. You know, like, yeah. so I'm totally tied to somebody somehow, and that's all I care about. <laughs> now. One of the other one of the other aspects that's pretty common within Blades in the Dark is give is giving mecha- giving mechanics to the hideout or or its equivalent. Um, is that something that's going to be carried over into Chew, or is that something that's going to be hacked around? That's like an amazing question. Uh, yeah, just the way that, like I actually never get that one. Um, so far, it's completely cut out. Yeah, one. Um, we have a little bit of a variant because we care about like who you work for. And we have a lot of ideas because in the comics, there's a lot of people that the characters work for. And they get demoted and promoted and moved around and transferred. So we have these performance ratings that are kind of tied 
to each job that you have, they kind of talk about like what kind of access you have to like top secret information or what kind of funding you have. Um, but they're more like ratings to give us an idea, like a loose idea of where you stand in the organization for stuff. Like, are you their golden boy? So like you can get away with stuff that mm -hmm. other people can't like you, have a, you know, a five in one of these three ratings. So that's kind of our alternative is we've been working more with what we call beats, um, which is like, what's your beat? Um, but that's so, it's kind of a little bit of your background too. So well, there, there's some wiggle room there. But yeah, we've kind of been looking at that as in like, do you work for the FDA? Do you work for NASA? Do you work for the National Weather Service? And as we expand, you know, are you in the Jersey mob? Are you in the Yakuza? Are you a Kagushin assassin? Um, it, it opens up to a lot of different kinds of play eventually too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when it comes to those beats, is that spelled? Is that spelled with two e's? No, no, but it could be right now. B E A T, following the police. Spelled with a yeah. Z. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm just saying, with all, with all the nods to, to, to food, to food, yeah. To get throughout the game, I fig, I figured that'd be an obvious one to go with. And you don't know the comics, right? Um, to an, to an extent, but I'm not gonna claim, I'm not gonna claim expertise. And yeah, well, then you know the beats thing. That's I wondered if you pulled it out of the blue or not. Yeah. Um, no, I just I just improvised that. <laughs> the title character only has one food that they can eat, where mm. otherwise they see the history of it, which leads to the gory details of like you eat a hamburger, you see how the cow was this exact cow was killed. Yeah. <laughs> you see them process through the meat grinder, like you know, it makes you not want to eat anything, right? You don't. You don't even, want to be in the. You, you don't want to see how the sausage is made. Yeah, and you see it with everything. I mean, even the flowers. You know, you're just like, you know if somebody, like, pooped on it. You know if it, like, yeah. had a mushroom. You know if there was bugs that ate it. You know, like, you just know all the gory details. Because it's kind of based on, like, how much of it you eat. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> which leads to other interesting <laughs> collections of problems. But beets is the one thing that Tony and uh, Tony's family, it seems like, can eat with no care at all like they just and if anything we actually see a little bit in the comics at least with their family and some other people like if somebody eats beets it kind of like blocks other people's powers to them though there's a there's some room there like one of the other characters is persimmon so there's you know there's certain foods for different people so yeah now with with that with that kind of thing in mind um now this is this is I'd say a fairly obvious question, but it is one, it is one that I feel I'm I feel I'd not be doing my job if I didn't ask. For those who are approaching this from a role playing perspective who have not read Chu at all, how 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 easy or how difficult will it be to will it be for them to for them to dive in since there is the there whenever you're um adapting some adapting an IP in that regard there is the issue of continuity lockout or how much foreknowledge you need to have mm -hmm. yeah I, I mean when i was running it for origins in gen con sometimes i wouldn't i would ask you do you even care like uh and what i, I really love doing was just be like yeah i'm not going to tell you guys anything um because the the game is uh it's really easy to hop into. There's a lot because you understand that it's set in modern times. Uh, and as the story progresses, you kind of discover the genre that you're in. Uh, so people just kind of hop into it real quick without like, and a lot of the people who showed up for Origins and Gen Con, I, I would say about like 40% of the people uh, or even 50 uh, had no idea what the the comic book was. They just saw like a game that was called Cockholster or Long Long Man. And they're like, I want to be a part of that. That looks awesome. Um, and that that was it. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, when it when it comes to the when it came to the uh, quirk when it came to the quirk list, um, is it a, is it a case where you guys have a specific set of, set of quirks, or are you are you doing a setup so that people so that people can create their own? Um, there's quirks, but they can totally make their own because they're usually like a sentence, you know, like you can, you can, uh, roll mashed potatoes in your fingers to make golems, mm -hmm. you know, like, so, uh, with that, they're very easy to make. 
Um, and the only check is really how. Like, I know one of the ones that caused us some concern at first was you could use sugary foods to, like, make anything. But thankfully, because of the Forge in the Dark background, like, you can create clocks. So, like, making clocks for, like, how long does it take you to make anything? Like, I'm going to make a peppermint tank. Well, we can kind of control that as a game master by, like, okay, cool. Um, that's probably, like, a six-segment clock or something. You yeah. know, to give it a little bit of room. Like, we don't want to make your power suck. But, like, so that it I clearly does you. You, just because you can do it doesn't mean you can do it instantaneously. It's not magic, right? Like, you need a lot of peppermints to put them together, and I don't know if you lick them or whatever you do, heat them to a temperature. Yeah. Um, definitely gives a new meaning to playing with your food. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and uh, yeah. What I love, too, is I think that'll be a great way for people to personalize it, because especially even asking the other uh, people on the team and the stretch goal writers, like, what's your favorite food? And, like, what can you do with it? Is a great way to approach it because we already have every one of us has attachment to some foods for some reason and then like you can totally play with that or play with your food or like how would you use it or what could you do i'm sure there'll be quite a bit more guidance eventually that'll talk about like you know we want them to be kind of weird and specific like you know we some nothing stops you with the sentence of being like you know I am 100% invulnerable and can fly and can, you know, so there'll be some guidance of, like, what's the one thing you can do, right? Like, um, and obviously GM approval, you know, but yeah, but there's already, like, on every playbook sheet, there's a custom, there's a line that says custom quirk, right? And that's for them to make. And quirks don't have to be food powers. Like, you can, they're, like, there's cyborgs. There's a lot of cybernetics that happen in Chu, especially because these government agencies have, like, big budgets. You know, NASA's is out of control. The USD. Yeah. Yeah, you're getting all the money funneled to them. So, uh, like, robotics and cybernetics and food-powered weaponry from their their archivists or whatever they call their specialist weapon people. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you could be, like, a celebrity. You know, there's a lot of normal stuff. We, we joked because there's a future part. So we, like, we talked about, like, what if you're an FDA agent from the future that comes back to the past? You know, so it's also, like, what is your one weird thing, right? Like, what's your shtick? But it doesn't define you as much as approaches or your playbook. Yeah. It's just kind of like another awesome thing. But often it becomes like the fourth or fifth thing we talk about, mm -hmm. which in most superhero games, it'd be like number one. Well, I want to do this and everything else caters to it. And this, it's like, oh, yeah, that's the thing I do, <laughs> which is awesome. But it's not who you are necessarily. Yeah. Now, talk to me about the corkboard thing. I am. Um... I can I can see some people using that to make the to make the conspiracy theory meme, be, but um, how did how did that particular idea come about? <laughs> did you want to talk about the corkboard, Sam? Yeah, I uh, the corkboard is probably one of one of the most fun or the the best aspect of the game, uh, and we have uh, a corkboard that could be purchased along with the the book as an add on or pledge level, um, and I mean. It's that Always Sunny in Philadelphia, the Charlie Day meme. And, you know, it, it helps the players and the GM kind of organize the information uh, and create more of a hands-on approach to the experience. Uh, I mean, food in general is a very hands-on approach type of thing. And so any, any way to kind of bring the table into performing activities uh, while everything is going on uh, just kind of fit very well. And so as you're playing and you're talking to NPCs and stuff like that, you're like, this guy seems really suspicious. Or, um, you know, what? I figured out uh, what weapon they use. You can just grab uh, a little item and, and place it on the cork board, and then, bam, you, you kind of you have it. And it, it's there, and it's a concrete uh, notebook for everyone to get behind. Uh, during a case um, and so during origins and uh, gen con uh, we took pictures of everyone's cork board uh, at the end of it and they're there are hilarious and they help tell the story uh, for the people involved as well as everyone watching mm -hmm. and then you know from playing games just in general like that uh, so many people come with like some backstory or some ideas or side ideas and we already put like a trouble like some inherent persistent problem that every character has that plagues them like 
you know, like I love in Tropic Thunder when like I got your TiVo and you're like, how did you even yeah. get here? Well, I, I thought you were going to leave me and you were my first client. I, I came all the way here to save you. But by save you, I mean just <laughs> deliver your TiVo so you don't yeah. go to a different agent. Um, we wanted to make sure these things weren't lost on players either. So like the the table tool of the cork board, it starts in that very investigative fashion. But it's a sneaky way of like being the campaign at a glance of making connections over time that lead to building conspiracies, which is a, a thing in the game, right? Mm -hmm. And also to keep all of this stuff in the forefront because players can be so descriptive in what they do and how they do it. So like having your trouble and having like your friends and their restaurants they go to and what they like to eat and who, who poo pooed on who and who doesn't like each other anymore all on the table. Mm -hmm. And then how that ties into cases is just, it's just all fuel. Right, it's all there for anyone to poke fun at, pick on, use for or against you. But it keeps it all in the forefront and not hidden on your sheet or something you could forget about or something that gets overlooked. Um, so yeah, and for game master for like running games for beyond like a session, it's great because it's literally like, what's my prep? Oh, how do I recap? Yeah. Oh, I look at the board and I, I like remind myself as I go, why is that here? Why is this connected to so and so? Why did we put a question mark there? So it, it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Now. We dipped into we dipped a bit into the into the way um, playbooks are going to work, but I'd like to delve a little bit deeper into those since the playbook is going to be the most um, player facing thing that is going to be seen in a, in a given session. So mm -hmm. I do so I do think it I do think it's important to delve into it, and I'd like to I'd like to go from top to bottom, starting with the expert. What does the expert bring to the table? You know what I should do <laughs> is I should literally look at the playbooks because we made sure there's a box that tells you this. Mm -hmm. There's a box that basically tells you like who they yeah. are, but also like what kind of player might want to play this person, um, which is very helpful with pregens. But it's also great just because like at a glance, like you said, like people don't always know what they're getting into. And I've had some of the worst sessions I've ever had of playing a game when it's like, Oh, I'm a bard, and all I ever want to do is like be like have a lemonade stand and an empire for it, and like I can be anything I want to be, right? I can like do whatever. It's a role playing game, and then I'm like stuck in a dungeon with a group of people who don't give a shit about my lemonade. They just like sing the songs, Aww. bard. Sing the songs. I'm sorry, Pete. Yeah, it, I'm, I'm still a little. I'm still a little hurt about this. Yeah, like holy heck. Um, I was hoping I bought myself enough time to get to the sheets, but yeah. So going down until I find them, the expert is exactly that. In some ways, they're the egghead, right? They, they have an expertise in something in particular, uh, whether it's they're a writer or they're an astro uh, astronomer. <laughs> it's like, am I going to say it right? They have some level of expertise that they take to greatness. They're a painter, they're a cook. Um, so their abilities uh, allow them to dig deeper into such things, uh, to have more expertise, more contacts, be respected in their field. Yeah. Um, they also have one of my personal favorites, which is like they can. One of the perks is like psychedelics. <laughs> oh <laughs> God, yeah, uh, you mean... plenty of moments, especially NASA with all that funding. They talk about all these remote NASA places, uh, like observatories, and like everyone's just tripping balls. <laughs> so we had to make sure that some of these elements they kept ref kept coming back to, and the comics were in the game, right? So. The, the expert is the one who also has the ability that specifically allows them to use psychedelics to, like, create leads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, next would be the hotshot. And why don't you start with that one, Mitch? Yeah, I mean, the hotshot's one of my favorite. It's based on uh, Colby from the comic books. Uh, who is, you know, it's uh, the, I guess, uh, the stereotypical hotshot at the... Um, uh, at the precinct you know they think they're they're tough shit and stuff like that they're more often uh thrown into desperate situations um and so some of the perks that we have kind of uh allow them to do some cruel things while in a desperate situation uh or just to throw down with like a group of uh minions and such uh so they get lots of like action-packed cool stuff that just really drives home the, like, you know, I, I'm the top of the food chain uh, wherever I'm at. So, for example, now i got to pull that up. It says, like, the hotshot is a brash hero who stops at nothing to crack the case. Play the hotshot if you prefer style to substance. 
Do you think with your fists or if you laugh in the face of danger, like Agent John Colby of the FDA? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. He's a good man. He's the oh. best of us. Yeah. Now, the next one, the next one on my list would be the inspector. Yeah, so the inspector, a shrewd detective, an inveterate professional. Play the inspector if you like to track down suspects, uphold the law, or have a taste for the truth. Truth. Does that mean that Spider Jerusalem would be an inspector? That's a horrifying thought. (laughs) Spider Jerusalem is an amazing name. It is. Some of the perks, like, uh, so I look at this, um, you can fast talk. When you dig in, which is a way that you can lean on your approaches for an extra die, um, in addition to other effects, choose one. You talk circles around someone and they become confused or compliant. Or they let something slip. So it's a neat way of like, when you dig in, you already either get more effect or an extra die, giving you better chances to roll better. But, and we give you one of these cool things narratively. Yeah, now... The next one that I have on the list is the low life. <laughs> Mitch, I'm gonna kick it to you, but it's, I, I didn't mean that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you should be the one to talk about. The I low know life. the low life. Uh, the low life uh, is one of those interesting characters because we definitely wanted um, an aspect, uh, especially in the new series CHU. Chu, uh, they dive more so into the criminal element, and so. Uh, the low life is the person who who gets around the normal means of um, of the law, and so they're the ones you go to if you want to kind of get in on a criminal organization or get a unique perspective on an investigation. Uh, they're the ones already eating chicken because uh, they just don't care. They they might even be a part of the chicken smuggling or an informant for the FTA. Um, so yeah, you definitely play that if you kind of want to be the bad boy outside of. Outside of the law. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you're, you kind of hinted at this earlier, but the next one that I have on the list is the mascot. Yeah, and not to bore you with the description, but yeah, the mascot's awesome, right? Like we kind of said, like the, they're almost like the supportive character, but one of my favorite abilities of the yeah. uh, the mascot is this one. Let me see which one. It's so lovable. Ones. Yeah, well, there's, there's so many good ones, but... Um, what is the? Yeah. Okay. Well. Anyway, there's so many good ones. The razzle dazzle. When you dig in, addition mm-hmm. to any other effect, is you choose one. The bystanders can't help but watch in awe. Or wherever you are, you draw a crowd. Um, Ninja cream puff is a huge favorite. Where it's basically mm-hmm. everyone underestimates you. So when you let them, you can engage in hand-to-hand combat using your charm. Instead of like your guts or something you would normally use, mm-hmm. so um, you know, meant to be like you don't expect it, but they sucker punch you and they're good at it. Um, but there's an ability I, I'm I'm not seeing it right here in front of me. But we talked about all the time. Maybe it got changed because you know mm-hmm. things are constantly changing. But I loved that it was like you could get to anybody. So it was like the mascot was the one. It's like if there's a rock concert in town or like the president yeah. here. Like if you use this ability. You can get to them. Now, the thing that's funny about it is, like, they also have abilities where it's like even you, even like the the most hardened criminal or someone, give you sympathy, like puppy dog eyes kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But um, but I love the one where it'd be like, ever, we're all trying to get to like the VIP person in the crime, and like you just are talking to them, and they're like they're in the green room or something, and we're like, how did you get there? What is going on here? And it, it's you're that character, mm-hmm. right? You're the one who, like, luck favors. Um, you break the rules when it comes to, like, being cute and charming or, mm-hmm. being, like, <laughs> vulnerable and naive but, like, effective. I, I, can get, I can certainly get that. The next one that I have on the list is the Prodigy. Oh, that's like the no, you know, the the one who uh, is is perfect. They so every time I see them played uh, so far in Origins, uh, they were like, you know, this is beneath me. Uh, they were like the the, the cream of the crop, uh, so to speak. Um, and so yeah, if you if you want to play like that character who is really good, um, who's kind of been uh, prepping for this these moments their whole life, like uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm sure Peter can kind of list off some of their perks. 
they're the one that's really weird in the way that like mm-hmm. like one of their perks is mental palace. Mm-hmm. And like in addition to getting the extra die, right? They receive a perfect mental map of their surroundings. Or they know exactly what's about to happen, though the final outcome remains fuzzy. Mm-hmm. We give them things that almost like make the game a little bit like the Matrix. Right? Like- as a player, that's kind of what they're going for, is that for some reason, you're just naturally, like, life is in easy mode. Now, not with everything. Like, you have a trouble like everyone else. And there's a lot of resentment and difficulty that comes from that, especially in a game where we have, we'll talk about conditions as well, like, where we have flaws that are social in ways that, like, force chemistry into the game amongst the characters because, again, we want them to have valuable relationships. We want them to make decisions that will sometimes create other people like, you know, if so-and-so doesn't take it very well when you lie to them. So we just got to make sure that they they never know about this. But we know they're going to find out. So anyway, what we like with the Prodigy is these cool abilities that just kind of like hack the game almost. Like they're the one that can have a second quirk. Why? Because they can use one of their perks to get a second quirk. The mental map thing. I mean, like, could you imagine... So we we have one one of our uh, game adventures right now where it's like on an island and like people use it and it's like oh there are underground tunnels uh, oh, I use mental palace and then like walk exactly to where they need to go to like yeah. if there's like an evil hideout or a secret laboratory or whatever the thing is that we need at the moment they walk right to it knock on the <laughs> the part of the hollow wall and go inside so mm-hmm. it's a neat it's a neat kind of character to have and very popular obviously in most noir themed. Um, sort of uh, mm-hmm. games, mm-hmm. and the next the next one, the man who's probably three days from retirement, the veteran. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Mitch, yeah. I, you should talk about this, but I, I always think about your game specifically. The first one I ran for Mitch was oh, um, yeah. God John John's character. God was his dog was named Sarge. Do you remember what his character name? No, was? I forget his name, but yeah, he he played this character and he was out of the game, right? I, I he think like bitter he, and salty was approaches. Yeah, <laughs> he was just he he was uh, the perfect example of what this character is supposed to be. Uh, in that, like you know, he was uh, he was either retired or like three weeks from retirement, uh, too old for this stuff. Uh, while I played like the opposite, I think I was a mascot or something like that. Um, but yeah, you know, they, they can rely on kind of the, uh, I mean, networks and connections, uh, but yeah, what are some of the perks they, they have, uh, uh, Peter, cause I always like hearing them. They're cool. For the veteran. Oh, this is my, f- there, there's a couple here because mm-hmm. we talked about flashbacks, didn't we? Um, maybe, no, we actually didn't talk about flashbacks. Yeah, so yet. Forge in the Dark has flashbacks. Is Forge in the Dark likes, especially with Blades, which is the core game. Mm-hmm. It was a heist game, and John Harper didn't want the games to be all about, you know, reconnaissance and scouting and legwork, which a lot of times heist games can end up being. He wanted like it be action packed and more like a movie, or you know, like an action movie version of it. So we have flashbacks in Forge in the Dark, and they're meant to, you know, kind of fill in the gaps. Of like, so we don't have these weird, awkward situations if you're like, okay, well, we knew we were going to bury bodies, so how come nobody brought a shovel? Like, clearly that was an oversight where professionals, our characters would not have forgot that. So, you did, you know, then somebody can be like, oh, yeah, well, of course, a flashback to, you know, the car where I loaded the shovels because I raided, like, my neighbor's, you know, garden shed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we can imagine that the person walked out to their shed again and was like, oh, no, like, what happened? You know, like like it happens to them all the time, but they don't want to admit it or something. And they're like, I don't know why. I'm like losing my mind, my shovels. So the veteran has a lot of cool abilities that play with flashbacks. Um, one, because they have all this experience. But two, kind of... Um, uh, and they would just say that they, they play with the... You know, they have a lot of experience to pull from. So like memory lane. You can flashback yeah. to declare a direct connection between yourself and a suspect. Mm-hmm. So like you meet somebody randomly... And now you can say that, like, on the corkboard, you can literally throw on the corkboard, put a line between you two, and now you know whenever they're lying or stretching the truth. And it's very easy to make a direct connection. So the person with memory lane is going to keep trying to make connections on the corkboard so that they can know who's lying and who's stretching the truth. And it becomes a fun little game in a way because, like, 
<laughs> they're kind of racing to put everyone on the cork board as every case happens. Mm-hmm. But trouble, my old friend. You needn't spend appetite, which is our resource for um, resisting or getting an extra die by leaning into your uh, approaches and stuff. Sometimes you use them for a flashback, so clearly... Trouble, my old friend, you needn't spend appetite on flashbacks so long as you allow the GM to invite your trouble into the scene. So if you want to trade it, you don't have to spend your resource, but we're going to keep throwing that trouble, and it's going to keep getting bigger and worse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I kind of like the neighbor one. Yeah. It probably sounded like I liked it, but... <laughs> um. I almost like the scenes behind the scenes of, like, telling the players of, like, how the person is, like, their family is worrying about them and they're walking around the, the yard all the time. It's like everyone thinks they have Alzheimer's, but they don't. Mm-hmm. And it's because their neighbor keeps stealing shit from their shed and putting it back. Now, the last, the last but certainly not least entry that I have is the, is the wronged. This is a pretty fan favorite, Mitch. Tell him about Mason Savoy. <laughs> Tell oh, him about the Vendetta character, the anti-hero. Mason Savoy. Oh, Mason Savoy. Oh, God. He, he's one of my favorites uh, of the, the comic books. Um, and he is the... Uh, he's the one who understands that something is behind everything. Um, and so, yeah, they're the conspiracy nut. And, and in this case, like, the conspiracy might have some, uh, some weight to it. Um, and so, uh, they're the ones who kind of, uh, peer through the mystery, as it were. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so these characters, like, they're obsessed, right? Oh my god, yeah, as I'm looking at it. Shit list is one of my other favorites. You keep a list of anyone who's wronged you. Gain plus effect when you act to undermine them. <laughs> Receive one XP when you cross someone off your list. Will you put them in the ground or make amends? It's just that's just a running game that's fun with them. <laughs> like that's not, that sounds that sounds like a dwarven book of grudges, and I approve. <laughs> Mostly because I have my own book of. I'm not a dwarf, but I have my own <laughs> book of grudges. Some uh, uh, some people have multiple volumes worth of entries in it. One of my As favorite a... things about the wronged that I don't see enough of. But I look forward to you, like, in prolonged play. Mm-hmm. Is we gave the wrong to a lot of things. Like, literally, one of the perks is villainous. If there was one character who might, by the end, be the bad guy that was a player character, it very much would be the wrong. Mm-hmm. They have, like, we had we said shit list. So it's like, I can imagine a, a game where it's like, over time, they have they have dirt, and they're so mad at every one of the player characters, like, everyone's on the shit list, that they turn villainous mm-hmm. and underhanded. And uh, But they a lot of these abilities are almost, like, cheesy pseudo villain ones like they're good with disguises um they they can mark the ruthless condition uh they're like uncannily stealthy like in mason savoy is like a larger than life character that they they always show like his gut hanging out too and so but it's funny because like they always have him doing backflips and cartwheels and being like super agile and dexterous so you know it plays to that too he's a smooth criminal like mm-hmm. yeah now, with all with all that in mind, um, what are you guys shooting for as far as a page count? Uh, yeah, I mean, it looks like the core book will be around two twenty five, and the uh, uh, that we're doing two books. So the setting book, which is the Chew Universe, uh, looks like probably about two fifty. And these are the size of comic books, or the size of the trade paperbacks if you buy the volumes, or kind of like Blades in the Dark, but it's slightly bigger. It's kind of like a six by nine, but the comics are a little slightly larger six and a half by ten and a quarter or something if i'm correct off memory mm-hmm. and what are you shooting for as far as a re- as far as a release window which as an aside i do want to give my congratulations for uh for how le- for how well the kickstarter has been doing it's at 23.2 okay. thousand yeah. um, although i do have to ask the the dollar amount goal that you have set in that seems a little bit too perfect, so I have to ask, Mitch, was that you? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Not sorry. <laughs> I was going for the Final Fantasy, like, 9,999 limit break, you know, but... Yeah. Uh... I feel Peter, I mean, as we discovered via karaoke, Peter is the deep, soulful person, uh, and I'm the one who sings Spice Girls, so uh, <laughs> that that's that's how we work. 
I'm just saying. I'm just saying, Mitch. You're probably you're probably the most likely person I I've had I've had on this month who would who would probably do who would probably jukebox bomb at least one bar. Oh yeah, yeah. I think we actually did that. Uh, yes, yeah, that last origins, and yeah, yeah. that totally happened on mm -hmm. Sunday, Saturday. Well, it was Saturday into Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> no regrets. No regrets. Yeah, I look. It's it. Look, it it takes an asshole to know one. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> you know, and I didn't think about it till just now that like maybe I did put nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine, but Mitch just like turned two of them upside down. Probably, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> he just walked by behind me. I did give him collaborator privileges, so he probably just walked by and was like, "Yeah, I I plan on just shifting everything and <laughs> just changing it without his knowledge." So okay. it's just all, yeah. I'm, all I'm saying is you're probably you're probably going to you're probably going to pull pull something stupid when if you end up getting to four hundred and twenty backers. Oh yeah, it's just gonna be. I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we already <laughs> talked about the steak. Yeah. <laughs> like that's probably the next social stretch goal. The first one is we're going to play trivia and we're either going to we're going to find some great people to play trivia against. Like we'll either get like we'll see if we can get like Rob. Rob probably. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> well, I mean John would be the one who would be much more likely to do it, but he knows it all. Like I don't, I don't know if we want to play the dev, the dev team versus John Lehman the creator. But um you know what we should really do is like Josh, Mitch. Mitch knows who I'm talking about. Like in our Chew Facebook group, we have people who like diehard Chew fans. So we need a name, Mitch. I don't know. We need like the the Chewables or something. Who are, like, oh, the Chewables. Groupies. Like, can that just be it? The Chewpies. Like, yeah. It was kind yeah. of the Chewables is probably bad. Chewables but is better. There are some people who are like like we met. We have a, a guy named Josh in the group who like. You know, he just has all kinds of insider knowledge because he's been following them and, and, you know, intimately knows too. So, like, it, it would be really fun to get, like, a couple people like that against the dev team. Mm -hmm. We're like, mm -hmm. we we know a lot, but I, I, I'd really be curious of how well we do against, like, one soup, one one food yeah, power yeah. beef fan. <laughs> but with, with, that, with that said, I would like to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the sh to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here in the temple. Yeah, thank you. This is great. Yeah, we even got to talk history and RPGs. I can't yeah. do that that often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> it's hard it's hard finding people to just talk that stuff with. <laughs> Anytime you guys see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often Aww. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> oh yeah. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>